welcome to the tutorial session for um, create and deploy a lightweight microservice in WebAssembly. So we have a lot to cover today. And, uh, but first of all, I want to um, introduce the, uh, the panels of the speakers. So my name is Michael Yuan, and I'm the um, uh, maintainer and the founder of the Wasm Edge project, which is uh, uh, the WebAssembly runtime in the CNCF sandbox. Um, and uh, um, here we have Vivian Hu and uh, uh, Hong Yin Tai, and uh, you can call him Hai Dai. And they're, uh, I'm based in the United States, they're both based in Asia, so they flew 15 hours to be here to give this talk, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, yeah. So, so um, the agenda of the talk is that, um, you know, um, we're gonna spend, I think, maybe 10, 15 minutes to talk about the background of the whole thing, you know, why do we need WebAssembly? You know, WebAssembly has been, um, you know, a hot topic for, I think at least for this conference, you know, uh, the opening keynote, um, you know, um, talked about maybe the next thing would be the WebAssembly, right? You know, so, you know, there has been uh, a lot of interest. So um, we're gonna spend a couple minutes to talk about, um, um, especially, you know, how WebAssembly fit into the uh, typical use case scenario of a microservice, what we see, you know, what our uh, users uh, and uh, our customers in our community has been, have been doing with WebAssembly and the microservices. And then we have a series of uh, four tutorials. They are all hands-on. And uh, if you have your computer here, you know, you, um, you, know, um, I, you, know you, you are welcome to follow along. They are not super complicated. They are something that um, you have all seen before in the world of Java, in the world of Node.js, and in the world of other languages that you have used for, uh, for, for microservices. We are just going to have a new stack that's, um, that, um, that, that we're going to use a WebAssembly for that, and I can tell you why and how to do that, right? So, you know, uh, so we can have a series of four tutorials, and uh, uh, each of them takes about, I would say, 20 minutes from, from f start to finish. So we may not have time to cover the number four, although I think the number four is quite interesting because it does, um, it really showcases um, um, uh, why you need WebAssembly, and it combines hot topics like ChatGPT. You know, so yeah, if we if we don't have t time to get to the, the last demo, you know, you are very welcome to uh, try it yourself. And uh, um, so all the resources, including all the demo steps, um, is available in that GitHub uh, repository. You know, KubeCon EU 2023, and uh, um, you know um, this uh, QR code is a is a um, is a Bitly link that that goes directly there. So you know, um, just go ahead and check out and follow along. And, uh, but if you just want to uh, sit back and enjoy, because this is the last day of the conference and I'm the talk before lunch, you know, so you are, you are more than welcome to uh, follow us. That's, um, uh, you know, we're gonna go through all the steps on the stage and explain what each step does. So, you know, that's um, the, the agenda of the talk. So I'll start with, you know, the, the why question, the so what question, you know, that's, uh, you know, we, in this industry, we keep reinventing the wheel. You know, that's uh, why do we need another thing to run WebAssembly? You know, isn't the, 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 the current technology good enough? You know, that's, so there's a, um, you know, from, at least from our point of view, there is a distinct trend that's um, happened, I think, um, uh, post pandemic, is the rise of lightweight microservices. You know, what does that mean? You know, I think one of the tipping point is about this guy, you know, his rocket just exploded yesterday, but, you know, um, you know, I, I heard it was a success, you know, although it exploded, but, you know, um, people have a lot of different opinions about him, but I think those, this series of tweets really, um, you know, um, gets a lot of people thinking about uh, the web, uh, the micro, uh, microservice architecture. You know, so he said, um, when he took over Twitter, he, he went there and said, um, he didn't realize there's over a thousand RPCs, you know, what he really meant is web services, uh, is microservices. You know, within Twitter, there's, uh, if, you think, if you think about Twitter, it sounds like a fairly simple application, right? Uh, how is it possible that needs a thousand microservices? But that's, that's actually not far from the norm. You know, we have worked with, um, you know, um, large internet companies, both in Asia and in the United States. We have routinely see applications that requires 10,000 microservices or more. Those are 10,000 different services, not 10,000 machines. Each service requires uh, separate, uh, you know, a couple of machines. So, you know, um, there's really an explosion of microservices. And uh, 
how to manage those microservices and how to make them run efficiently has become a, a, a huge challenge. So you have you know, patterns like the service weaver and you know things like that. There are lots of solutions out there trying to do that. But one of the most direct thing to do is to make those services much lighter and much faster. You know, so there is a, um, you know, in the context of make, so that's where this whole idea come from. Because in the, um, I would say, uh, you know, I hate to use the word traditional because, you know, Java may be traditional, but microservices is, you know, a lot of people consider it's a fairly new technology. But if you look at how um, a microservice is set up today, you typically have a language runtime. May, it may be a Go runtime, it may be uh, Node.js, or it may be Python, or maybe JVM. You have a language runtime. Outside of the language runtime, it's wrapped around with a Linux operating system. And outside of that is a container, or it's a micro VM, it's a firecracker, or it's a, or it's a Linux container. And uh, after that, it's, uh, there's uh, the Kubernetes pod, and you know, things like that. So when you combine this all together, if uh, you are talking about a very simple function, that may, all it does may be sending out an email. So one of the um, microservice that uh, Elon Musk turned off and caused a lot of trouble was the service to send out SMS message for two-factor two authentication, right? And then pe suddenly people can't log into Twitter anymore, right? You know, so those are the things you see they are very, um, you know, um, they do one thing and, uh, um, and it's not very computational intensive. What they do is call another API, you know, you, uh, maybe a Tivolo or maybe a Teleco API or something like that to start a whole um, Linux system and then start um, the, the, uh, the JVM inside it just to do this one thing. Um, and it's not, super, it's not very complex and not computational intensive. It's very, um, I would say, it's very um, wasteful. So um, in, the, in, the, in the way of the, the new jargon, it's a zero interest phenomenon, you know, meaning there's, um, you know, people are washed with money, so, so they don't care, you know, just to, you know, throw more, more machines at it, right? You know, but I think we are in a different era now, so you know, we are looking for efficiency. I think that's the primary driver of um, you know, um, um, the so-called lightweight microservices, right? So um, I think we have just to talk about those pain points. You know, there's, they are heavyweight, they are very slow, especially at startup time. You know, if you have used say, things like AWS Lambda, it's one of the biggest problems that they have you know, is that the, 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 the startup of the micro VM, Linux, and then JVM takes hundreds of milliseconds, you know, if not seconds, you know, so, so it's, uh, um, it's um, and, but you can say, okay, I don't, you know, it's startup slow, but it's okay, I can keep it warmed up. But as, long, but as soon as you keep it warm up, you are wasting even more resources because now you are idling, right? You know, so you can't scale back to zero. So you have, um, so you have a lot of issues like that. And uh, there is a general trade-off between security and overhead, you know, because uh, if you look at um, how Linux container is used, you look at projects like, um, you know, what's that project? Um, I forgot, it's escaped my mind. But, you know, there, there's, uh, there are different projects, a runtime project that's, uh, that aim to secure Linux container, but they add weights to it, right? You know, it's in general not portable, you know, uh, because Linux container, you know, you need to differentiate what's running, um, you know, underneath it. If you look at, um, you know, um, uh, t today's cloud providers, they all have at least the ARM architecture and the Intel mm -hmm. architecture. If you, if you have more complex workload, there may be the GPU and TPU. And uh, if you look at, uh, there may be also RISC-V. You know, so there's lots of, you know, um, uh, the different architectures that's, that, that, that's in play today, right? So, those, uh, so there are many pain points to do that. So why is WebAssembly uh, uh, a good fit? So I'll make some very bold claims here. And uh, uh, Haidai would back me up with more details um, in, in his section. Is that the first, uh, for a comparable task, you know, so for say, um, I want a service to babysit a database, you know, it's very typical, say a Java pet store a type of application, you know, CURD, C-U-R-D, right? It's typically the 1% of the size of a typical Linux container applications. So instead of tens of megabytes or even 100 megabytes, this thing is measured in kilobytes. Okay, so you know, you think about that, a web server plus uh, MySQL client with a connection pool, everything added together is, um, is measured in kilobytes. And uh, uh, startup time is one millisecond, two milliseconds, so it's not in seconds, right? And this has near native runtime performance because there's a lot of compiler techniques that we can do to make it, uh, you know, compile ahead of time, not just the JIT like Java does, but AOT, right, ahead of time compiling. And uh, it's secured by default because it's a, 
it's a, uh, it has a very small attack surface. It doesn't have an operating system in it. So, you know, there's very limited ways you can attack it. So, you know, it's, uh, so it's secure in that regard, right? And it's completely portable across platforms. So this is, uh, a lot of people compare WebAssembly to Java. You know, it's, uh, um, it is a bytecode format that is abstracted away from the underlying CPU architecture. So, you know, so you can have, um, you know, you can have one, uh, one WebAssembly bytecode that goes across, say, ARM, Intel, and uh, RISC-V, and all those things, right? It's strive to be programming language agnostic as well. You know, that's actually an interesting point, and, and that's also a, 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 a bold claim that, um, you know, the community wants to make, but, you know, it's, uh, we are still getting there. So, you know, meaning that any programming language that's supported by the LVM compiler would eventually be able to compile into WebAssembly. That means C, C++, Rust, and, uh, um, you know, um, and in the future, uh, in the near future, I think we would have Go, and uh, um, and a variety of different uh, interpreted or you know um, high-level languages like Python. You know, VMware Labs, uh, VMware's, uh, you know, Wasm Labs has done a lot of work porting Python to WebAssembly, and we uh, we also have done a lot of work porting JavaScript and also Shopify. You know, there are a lot of companies in this space that are trying to make um, you know the everyday programming language more accessible to um, you know uh, in a WebAssembly environment for developers, right? So it plays, um, and also very importantly, and that's why we are in KubeCon, is that it plays well with, um, you know, a service mesh and uh, a Kubernetes. Uh, unlike the JVM, who has the same aspiration, but the JVM cannot be directly managed by Kubernetes. We all know that, and it's not a secure container. So you know, that's uh, um, so. Um, but WebAssembly is um, is different in that regard. It's designed from ground up to be, um, you know, um, um, uh, to to be a secure container. So. That said, um, nothing is free. You know, that's, I'm making some very bold claims. I said it's, uh, it's 100 times smaller, it's a thousand times faster, um, you know, um, and uh, as if there's no trade-off to be made, but there are trade-offs to be made. So there's no free lunch. The, the biggest issue here, you know, that's why, um, you know, we run tutorials like that. So to get developers, um, you know, um, 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 getting, getting developers started with WebAssembly development. It's the most important thing to remember, it's not a general OS environment. A lot of the, the benefit it has is because it's not Linux. But that also means if you have a Linux machine and you have locally tested uh, Linux application, you would not be able to directly run in WebAssembly because you know, the architecture is different. So um, there's new SDKs to learn, you know, that's, uh, or to do similar tasks. So there's, um, you know, um, in this ecosystem, there has been, you know, I think, uh, explosion of um, you know, uh, open source projects and also commercial projects, right? So there's a couple, um, you know, I, want, uh, I really want to call out, you know, like Spin by Fermion, you know, they, are, um, they have a really nice, um, you know, uh, JavaScript-based SDK and also Rust-based SDK that allows you to write, you know, um, um, you know, HTTP servers and, you know, th those type of applications. Um, in web running that inside, right, writing those languages and running that inside WebAssembly, right? You know, so they have their, um, they have a set of SDKs that APIs that you can use. And the Wasm Cloud, which is our sister project in, um, in CNCF Sandbox, it's, uh, it's run by the, the, the team at Cosmonic. They also have the idea um, you know, a similar approach, but they also have their own SDKs, right, you know, to solve, uh, you know, a, uh, a different set of problems. And then you have WASI Cloud and Component Models. This is, uh, you know, WebAssembly standard body, which W3C and Bytecode Alliance uh, wants to standardize uh, a lot of those external components to WebAssembly. It's sort of like the relationship between the JVM and the JRE, right? You know, that's, um, you know, at least I'm old enough to remember that. Maybe, maybe some of you guys too, you know, that's a, it's a core runtime and the library around it. So, you know, so there's also effort to standardize that. And uh, um, in this talk, we can also talk about you know, our interaction with Dapper, you know, because Dapper, um, you know, as a, as a, a microservice sidecar can bring a lot of value into WebAssembly. We, we're gonna talk about that later. You know, so with all those, those are new SDKs, um, you know, new things um, that's um, to develop new applications, what I would say. However, you know, one of the focus in our talk is what if you have existing microservices that use, that is written in established frameworks. So for instance, if you're a Rust developer, you are likely to have a microservice that's written in Tokyo, right, you know, or use Tokyo framework to do, um, you know, uh, networking and to do database access and, you know, things like that. Say if you're a JavaScript developer, your application is written in Node.js, is there a way to run them in a WebAssembly runtime? So uh, the answer is definitely yes. So that's, um, you know, something that's, you know, um, you, you know, we want to explore in our four uh, tutorials. So in the next um, couple of slides, maybe we can demo from here. 
we're going to talk about how Wasm Edge enables that, enables us to run those, um, you know, existing applications, existing microservices that are written in existing, um, you know, libraries. Hi, I'm Hai Dai, and today I'm going to talk about uh, how Watson Azure supports, you know, to uh, support the esteem projects. So uh, let me introduce Watson Azure first. Uh, actually, it's just uh, a Watson runtime, uh, like maybe you have learned from, you know, the Watson time or the uh, WMR or such of uh, uh, Watson runtime or Watson Shoot, right? And uh, we have different focus, for example, uh, we are focusing on uh, how to support the networking sockets and web service. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, actually, in the uh, current days, uh, you can find that there is some very limited socket support in the WASI spec. So you can only, for example, you can only accept something uh, socket. However, you cannot bind, you cannot do the domain and ser service checkup, and you cannot do the uh, TLS things. So we are focusing on how to bring this, you know, these powerful uh, networking socket applications to the Watson's world. And also uh, another focus on us is that uh, we want to support more and more databases because that uh, most of microservices, uh, they will, you know, communicate with the database, you know, you, you have to rewrite data. So let's, uh, you know, our another focus. And the third thing is that um, we all know that, you know, the AI inference is very big today, for example, the chat GPT, right? So uh, how to leverage those uh, AI model in Watson runtime is uh, the very key features in our uh, implementation. For example, we already support a TensorFlow, we already support an open vinyl, PyTorch, and more and more uh, AI frameworks in the near future. Also, we have already integrated into the existing cloud native infrastructure, so you can use Watson Edge uh, with the wrong WASI, or uh, use the Docker, use the Kubernetes, use the Container D, you know, to manage your Watson application, and then, we have learned that there, the JavaScript community is very huge. So, you know, we want to help them to acquire their, you know, current project uh, into the Watson's world. So that's our um, very big difference um, with the other, you know, the other Watson runtime. So, uh, how do we mean the light way? We have two examples, and one is the Redis application, and the other is PostgreSQL client application. And with these two application, is already run into the Doc Plus Watson technical preview. So you can go to the uh, Docker's website and download the technical review version and try to you know play with uh, these two demo. And you can find out that the total application size is pretty much smaller than uh, uh, than the usual case. For example, you only have uh, 0.7 megabytes here and 0.8 megabytes here, and it's pretty small. That's why we are, you know, we want to help the current container with providing a new way, which is the more lighter way, you know, to uh, manage some, uh, you know, some library service. So how we bring these features to, you know, to the uh, esteem project. That is, uh, just I mentioned that uh, the WASI socket spec is not, you know, not very, it's very limited and it's not very useful for the uh, current project. So we enhance with the following uh, important features. The first thing is that uh, no one like blocking, right? If you, you are running a blocking socket, then lots of, you know, the uh, data intensive application will stack your whole uh, stack. So we enable with the number blocking socket. So now you can do, you know, concurrently the uh, HTTP request and uh, database query. Also, one very important thing is that uh, somebody just told us, hey, why the WASI socket can only accept IP address, you know? When I deploy our service on the Kubernetes, and I, we will get lots of, you know, domain names. So the uh, one important thing is that how to support the domain name, uh, for example, the, the name service lookup from WASI spec. So we just port in from the uh, library uh, called get address info. So you can now retrieve those information in the uh, WASI level. 
Uh, also, TLS is good, you know, domain socket is good. The, the last of uh, feature is because we extend the current API so uh, you can do a uh, lot of stuff. And with this as our, you know, as our uh, infrastructure, how we bring these features to the uh, esteem projects. We just customize, you know, customize those guest uh, SDK. For example, we fork Tokyo, we fork MIO, and just, you know, uh, switch the WASI target to WASN Edge WASI target because we want to add those, you know, those powerful functions in uh, layer version. So the only thing you need to do is just change your name from Tokyo to Tokyo WASI, then that's done. We just want to, you know, simplify the, uh, you know, the programmer's life. So you, you, the only thing you need to do is just change the name. Okay, and we also create lots of forks for the uh, database client. So uh, you can just, um, you know, switch your, your roster credit and just use our version, you know. Okay, so that's how it works. And now in our demo, you can find out that uh, if you have the Rust Tokyo Best client or you have the, you know, the Node.js client, now you can work with the Watson Energy plus the uh, Watson Energy WASI socket. Yes. And we already support the following database, including uh, MySQL and MariaDB, PostgreSQL, SQLite, and you know, lots of other databases. If your favorite database is not on this list, we are very happy to have pull request, or we are very happy to hear that. So we are, uh, if you have any you know, recommendation, you can just talk about us, and we will try to you know, just implement your, you know, your favorite database client. Uh, yeah, we can cooperate with that. And enable socket is not just allow us to do the database stuff. We also want to go beyond the database. So with our, you know, our uh, improvements, you can have uh, just, you know, use the hyper framework, use the request framework. Always, you, if you are using the Kafka, you can use, you know, the Rust Kafka to uh, integrate with us or Redis server or Anna Rust or Dapper, okay? And if you are using JavaScript, oh, we have already, you know, porting some uh, NPM and uh, esteem, you know, Node.js functions in our ecosystem. For example, if you want to use the React SSR feature, yes, you can try it. And if you have any interesting, which is not list on this slide, just talk to us. We are very happy to help you with, and we want to bring, you know, we want to enhance the whole community with, you know, more and more features. And we already integrate lots of the tooling. So uh, in, in our, you know, in our following demo, you will see the uh, darker one, okay? And if you are familiar with the ContentD or Kubernetes, you can use them with the uh, RunWasi support. And if you are using your Podman or you are on the Fedora, you can try uh, CRAM plus the Watson support. Yes, the, the all this on, on this slide, we already have integration and we are very happy to hear that you guys should try it. Okay, now uh, I think we have told lots of you know, non code stuff and I think everybody is now is running to, uh, you know, to see our demo. So let's uh, do our first tutorial. Let's welcome Vivian. Hi, I'm Vivian. Um, I, th I think we have learned why we need a WebAssembly, so it's time to do something. Uh, I will do the first tutorial, uh, create a complete three-tiered microservice with Docker plus Wasm. Uh, you can find the source code link, and uh, you can also scan this QR code to access all the re resources. Uh, in this tutorial, in this part, we only will use Docker, uh, last year in KubeCon Detroit, Docker announced its support for WebAssembly. It is a partnership with WordMage, 
With Docker support, we could run WASM containers side by side with Linux containers, which I will show you uh, in the, uh, next. Uh, with Docker support, we all, one more interesting thing is that uh, with Docker support, we don't need to install Rust and WASM Edge. We just need to install the Docker desktop. So uh, here is a typical microservice architecture. I think uh, most of you here are familiar with this image. We have a web server for the front end, and we also have a database. In the middle, we have our own business logic. It includes an HTTP server to connect to the web server, and we also have a MySQL client to access the database. They are all running in Linux containers. But with WASMage, this architecture has changed. We can see the green part. The green part is running is running in WASMage containers. We can also have our uh, own business log functions. Uh, in this WASM-based microservice, we can also have an HTTP server to connect our web server and a MySQL client to access the database. So uh, this is the uh, steps to create uh, an entire microservice. The first step is to download Docker desktop. The version should be 4.15 or above. In the GitHub repo, uh, we have uh, four steps to uh, reduce the, uh, the demo. So uh, the first thing is you need to uh, download Docker desktop. So uh, if you have a laptop in your hand, you can download uh, your Docker desktop right now. And the next thing is to get the source code. Uh, I already opened uh, uh, my, uh, my terminal. I forget, I already uh, uh, get cloned the, uh, the demo project in my computer. So uh, next, let's open the folder. And then we will just use one command line to build and run this microservice. We just use Docker Compose app. It may take a, a, a minute to to build and run this uh, microservice. I will ask uh, uh, Michael to uh, explain the code we use. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, so the microservice itself is written in Rust. So um, I know maybe many of you are more familiar with Go or JavaScript, but just bear with me for a minute, and I'll show you how simple Rust can be for a microservice environment, right? We are, um, you know, just to emphasize what Vivian had just said, as you can see, we just downloaded um, Docker Desktop. We did not download Rust. We did not install Rust. We did not install WebAssembly. We did not install anything. Docker takes care of all that, you know, because it's a it's a uh, it's a containerized build. So you know, so it, uh, so it downloads the correct container to build it, right? So um, can I make this bigger? I think, yeah, okay. So this is the uh, code. You know, it looks um, fairly long, but really the important thing is at the end. You know, the main function. You know, it's like go or C. It has a main function. The main function has two parts. The first is to set up a connection pool to a database. Okay, it's a uh, it's very, if you are familiar with Java and you know, it's a very familiar process, you know, basically you build up 
uh, a connection URL to the database, and you give it options. You have a database connection pool, so five to ten connections, and sitting idle in there. And uh, when you need it, it's, uh, you get a you get one from the pool. So you set up the database connection pool first, and then the second part of it is to start a server. Okay, so this piece. You start, you start a server and bind it to the uh, local IP address. The server is running on 8080. And uh, when the request comes in, you know, so here is a little bit Rust syntax, you know, it's an it's a asynchronous function so that when a uh, when request comes in, so you can handle multiple requests from here, right? So when a request comes in, start a kick off as asynchronous function. And uh, what the asynchronous function does is that it calls the method handle request and pass in the HTTP request and the database connection pool, okay? So that's really um, the whole setup logic. You know, essentially, you create a database connection pool, you create a web server, and when the request comes in, you call a function called handle request and pass in the request and the database, con uh, database pool. So the, the bulk of the application is actually in this handle request. You know, so the, in this uh, asynchronous function in Rust, so you know, it's handled by Tokyo. And uh, if, you, if you read into that, it's actually very simple. So it really detects what's the URL elements that's in the incoming request. If the incoming request is slash INIT in it, it would just say, okay, I'll get a connection from the pool and I'll send this SQL statement into this connection, you know, to initialize the database. So here is just the create, create table uh, connection uh, uh, statement, right? And if this comes in as a create order, I would, uh, you know, just, uh, um, you know, uh, because the create order uh, request has the, the order information as a, as a, um, in, in the body as a JSON object. They're going to pass out the JSON object. They're going to map it. You know, uh, Rust has very nice, um, you know, uh, strongly typed mapping between JSON and the, the Rust objects. You know, so I, I would just map that and I would create the SQL statement to do that. And, uh, you know, so the rest is just a curl application, you know, um, CURD, you know, create, update, uh, read, delete, right? You know, so here's, uh, you can create multiple orders. You can have an array of JSON objects and create them. And you can have update order. Yeah, you have update order. You have, you have the, the U here, right? And you, uh, you can have orders. You can get all the orders back in the JSON object. You, basically, it's a select statement, SQL statement for the database, right? So, you know, it's all, you know, very common, you know, stuff. And uh, it's just, uh, you know, just the syntax look different. So I keep encouraging people to, to learn a little bit of Rust. You know, it's like, uh, you know, all those years ago, I, I, I really encouraged those Perl programmers to learn a little bit Java, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, you know so uh, now I'm encouraging people to learn a little bit of Rust. I think, you know, Rust uh, may seem very intimidating, but it's not. You know, it's, uh, you can see this, um, everything here is, is really, you know, it's just, uh, you, you know, what we do on an every, every, everyday basis, right? You know, there's a little bit of error handling. You know, so you have, um, you know, you have the main function that set up all this, and then you have the asynchronous handle request. So let's see if this has, um, so Vivian, do you want to continue? Yeah. Yes. Um, oh, sorry, I'm too, I'm a little nervous, so I forgot something. Um, after in installing the Docker desktop, you should um, uh, enable a better feature in Docker desktop. So click on the setting and you will see feature in, oh, sorry, feature in development. We should um, select use KNID for pulling and storing images. This uh, adds the ability to run Wasm containers. This is a must have step. So if you mess something wrong, um, this may be the problem. Okay, uh, let's continue. I think the, uh, uh, the, the cleaners are running, so let's go back to Docker desktop and see what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, first, we can see we have three images, and the first one is called demo microservice, and it was a um, it was a WASM label. This means this a WASM images. And we also have a MariaDB and NGX image. Uh, I want to highlight um, the size here. As had I just talked before, the, WASM, the size of WASM, it, WASM image is very small. It only has three MBs. It's much smaller than MariaDB and the NGX. So WASM-based microservice is lightweight, fast, and secure. And uh, we also can see that we have three containers. 
uh, we have, oh, sorry, we have the client, we also have a DB, and we also have a uh, have a server. It is also lo labeled with Wasm, means it's it's a Wasm container. So with Docker plus Wasm, we could run Linux containers uh, side by side with Wasm containers. Uh, next, let's uh, uh, test if this demo works. Let's open the web URL. Let's click on add, a do uh, add an order. Uh, I will fix some information here. And click on add order. Here we can see we we already added uh, added an um, order, and we also can delete this order. So there is no orders. That says, is um, anyone have any questions? Okay, no questions. Uh, next, uh, Hale will dive in, um, deep dive into this um, uh, this code. Hello, everyone. It's Hai Dai again. Okay, so um, maybe you don't know. Uh, you don't just want to uh, use the. Uh, uh, black box, you know, just install Docker desktop and don't know how it, it, it really work. So, you know, I will show you if you don't have the Rust desktop, how complicated thing you have to do by yourself. So, um, let's go, the uh, first thing is that um, if you are not use Docker Compose, so the first thing, you will have the Rust program, right? And you have used the Rust tool chain to compile the program into the Watson application. And be careful, if you are using cargo build, you know, just a command, you forget to specify the target to Watson 32 Watson, then it will just not work because it will be compiled to the native code. So let's see the first trap here. And after you have the Watson application, and you have two ways to execute it. First one, if you don't want to, you know, you, you just want to run it, then you can skip the compiler part. You know, you just run the Watson with the uh, Watson which call runtime. And after the Watson edge call runtime is up, and we will figure out uh, which uh, plugin is used. For example, we all know here, we want to leverage the database connector. So we will have the Watson Edge socket extension, which can, uh, which is called, uh, included the binding function, the NS lookup, and lots of, you know, I just mentioned before, those feature is enabled. Then it will, you know, it will open several sockets, you know, raw sockets. So it will try to, you know, connect to the MySQL database with the, you know, the URL, and you will, provide the HTTP socket so you can have, you know, just the uh, website to con communicate with your application. And if you want to improve the performance of the current Watson application, actually, uh, Watson Edge provide a compiler, a, a head of time compiler, which you can compile your uh, web assembly application into, uh, you know, just a, well, with a section uh, provide the uh, native binary. So, you know, you can uh, execute this uh, binary format with a faster speed. So, uh, it's a little bit complicated. So, if you want to try it, because you have to, you know, install MySQL database and start it. So, I, I will, you know, I will um, suggest you to use a container, you know, to install those stuff. Then, uh, if you don't want it, it just, you know, delete the container. Then everything is gone, right? Okay. So, first thing is that, and um, let's go back to our GitHub. So, uh, you have to, you know, install the Rust toolchain, install Watson Edge, and install and start your MySQL database. So uh, I have, you know, I have a short script here. So if you uh, have your container, you can just copy and paste it. And uh, please 
you may need to you know change your password with MySQL Secure installation, and we will use the username and password in our you know uh, following steps. So after you are doing, uh, if you are done with the uh, installation, uh, I just use you know I just use a container in in Mac OS. Sorry, let me clean it up. Okay. So first thing, you will get the source code, and I believe you already get it in in our you know previous tutorial. So the first thing is we will need to build the application with Rust. So let's go back here and cargo build release target. And because you know, I don't want to waste your time. There are lots of people, so I already compiled it. So you can find it's very quickly here. But um, I don't want to, you know, remove the build folder and do that again. It will take a couple minutes. So if you are running it, uh, actually it will be a couple minutes death. So I just skip the part. Okay. And after you you create, uh, you know, you build your Watson application, uh, you can find your folder here. Uh, here is your target. So the Watson file is in, in this target folder. And here, okay, so this way. If you, you know, you build it, uh, actually you will download lots of credits you use in this project and try to compile all of the uh, Rust code into uh, this, uh, this Watson file. Then we have the second step, which is try to you know improve the performance with our AOT compiler. So you know just copy this one and pass here. And actually, it will take some time, maybe a couple seconds, you know, to do the optimization for your uh, host architecture. And you just compile, verify, and optimization. Now it's trying to you know uh, doing the output file. Let's just wait. Okay, it's done. <laughs> uh, actually, it's, it's more faster than, than you do the cut-off cut -off build, okay? <clears throat> so the next step is uh, we will, you know, we will run this application. Uh, you know, just copy it and pass. Uh, what's my password? Hold on. <laughs> Uh, let me check my history. Oh, cloud native. Okay, okay. Uh, now I remember my password now. <laughs> so after you know you execute this uh, file, it will show nothing. Why it will show nothing? Because it's a server, you know. So the other thing is that you can use you know your your browser just to uh, find out your you know your link with, uh, for example, the order. Okay, so. Uh, I, I have just put some, you know, put some uh, uh, data in here, so you can just uh, see the uh, details uh, before, you know, we, we do the, you know, we are building the, the database uh, sheet. So when you run it, the first thing is that you will need to init, okay? So just copy here and pass here and init. It will, go to, it will say that. Uh, the status is true, uh, which means uh, you already need it. And the second part is we want to, you know, we want to create orders with this order file. So you can find this orders JSON here, and we just want to add more and more uh, different order. For example, let's change those in and change here to cloud native. Okay, you can do anything you want with this order, okay? And then, just copy this, this line and it will try to, you know, insert those orders into the database. Okay, the status is true. Now, we can check all orders here with this, uh, this URL. And maybe it's not very pretty, so you can, uh, you know, you can try to use the JSON PP to make it uh, more uh, beautiful, right? So you can find this the order list here, 
uh, we just add a new order called the, the oh, sorry, I, I, I spell it wrong. It, it should be cloud native. <laughs> okay. Then if you want to uh, update something, you know, you can uh, use the following, uh, following command to uh, update the order. Okay, we can also, you know, change the update order here. Uh, cloud native. <laughs> this, this time is right, right? Okay, and we just copy here and paste. Now it's updated, so we can, you know, we can just try to uh, call the orders again, and you can figure out now. Yes, the cloud native is correct. Okay. Then you can use, you know, if you want to delete something, you can use the delete order uh, by yourself to do that. So, uh, because we have seen the website before, right? Uh, everything you do in command line, actually you can write a simple website, control it. So, uh, you know, you can just uh, go to our client folder and use the uh, simple script just, you know, create a simple uh, HTTP server to, uh, to rewrite the data. So if we, you know, if you use Docker Compose up, then you will start an Nginx server and do all stuff for you. But if you want to, you know, uh, go deep into it, you have to do all of the stuff by yourself. So now let's start a server here. Okay, we start in nice ocean. Okay, there's a lot of uh, orders we just, you know, we, we just uh, insert and update here. And now uh, I need to, you know, remove the wrong one, right? Not could uh, native, we delete it, okay? Okay, let's hold off, you know, hold off the uh, demonstration of if you are not using the Docker tool or any, you know, fully integrated tool, you have to go this step one by one by yourself. So you may be very complicated, but we are happy if you can, you know, you can try it. So let's go to our tutorial street, right? Yeah. So let's welcome Michael again. All right. All right, thank you, Haidai. And uh, um, I know it's lunch time, but I promise what I'm about to say is more interesting than lunch. You know? So it's to do more with Dapper, you know, there's, um, um, you know, I know what you're thinking. Um, uh, when, you he when you see the demo, the, the first two demos, it's a simple curd application. Okay, it looks cool, but feels like a toy, right? You know, that's, uh, so, you know, um, you are setting it up with a database you already knew, you know, MySQL database, and, you know, there's, um, um, you know, it's something, well, I would say a lot of microservices are simple functions like that. So um, uh, even in that context, I wouldn't say it is really a toy, but you know, it's uh, uh, like I said, you know, um, when Elon Musk wants to, wants to get rid of microservices in Twitter, you know, the one that he, he turned off is to send out SMS, SMS messages, you know, how complex is that? You know, so, you know, so, so there's uh, um, uh, a lot of microservices that, um, you know, um, that are at that, that complexity level. However, you know, um, if, you, uh, if you really have complex services that has, um, you know, need to access things like um, you know, uh, very, um, we already can access the Kafka queue and, you know, things like that. But you, you, you may need, say, MongoDB, not MySQL, or you may need something else. You know, that's, so there's lots of options out there. So um, how do we take the next step to make Wasm services, um, you know, interact with essentially all the infrastructure services that are commonly available in the microservice environment? That's uh, how we, uh, we get Dapper to help us. You know, uh, Dapper is also, I, I think, a CNCF uh, incubation project. So, you know, so they are um, they're designed for microservices. And so let me take one minute to introduce uh, the Dapper SDK for Wasi or Dapper SDK for Wasm Edge. You know, so the way Dapper works is that it is a sidecar. You know, so in a Kubernetes pod, you can have a Dapper sidecar running in a container and then the, um, the microservice application running inside another container, and they communicate with each other. So the Dapper uh, sidecar would provide services, you know, like uh, 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 secret store, uh, health check, database, uh, messaging queue, and you know, all that, um, you know, all kinds of nice things that you may have in the, uh, in the microservice environment to the, to, the, um, to the microservices you are running, right? 
So we are um, building the bridge between the uh, between the Watson microservice and the Dapper, right? So we have a uh, we have a Dapper SDK. It's currently written in Rust. However, we are pulling it to JavaScript as well. So uh, what it does is that from the Watson application, when you need to access Dapper services, for instance, key value store and you know things like that, you would just call Dapper. You don't need to know what's um, you know what's behind Dapper. So because Dapper itself connects to over a hundred different services, you know, like uh, all the common databases, all the common key value stores, and all the common messaging queues, all have, um, you know, all have integrations or connections with Dapper. So that really allows us to, um, you know, to expand the scope of, um, you know, um, um, uh, you know, Watson-based microservices, right? So that's the introduction. So let me give you, um, I think this is a fairly complex demo. So, you know, um, so in a minute I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it, I, I'm gonna show you it's running in uh, GitHub Actions because that's, um, you know, the most reliable way that I know how to run it. But, um, you know, it uh, it's consists of three services. It's an image uh, processing um, application or microservice. So it has two image processing functions. Each of them is a microservice. One is to turn an image into grayscale, okay? And, uh, you know, you can think a gazillion, a gazillion use cases for something like that. And the second is image classifier. What image classifier does is that it runs a TensorFlow model in um, a web assembly to recognize what's on the input image and spit out a text, right? So um, both of them are individual um, microservices, and they each have a Dapper sidecar connect to them. And then there's another one that's called event service because you know, we need analytics and observability from those two image services. So what we do is that instead of having the image service directly written into a common database for logging or common uh, uh, files, I have an event service. You know, that's fairly common usage pattern, right? You know, that's, uh, that captures the event from those, um, from those uh, image services on the front end. And then it writes into the database or writes into key value store, right? You know, so, uh, so, it, so the three service, you know, in a, um, in a I would say in a, in a um, simple or in a naive environment, you would have the URLs for each service hard-coded into each other, right? You know, you would have, say, the, the Grayscale service is aware of the, where the event service lives, its IP address or its DNS address. So when it needs to record something, we just, uh, you know, make an HTTP call for that API. Um, but uh, with Dapper, you can simplify this a lot because each of them connects to its own Dapper sidecar, and this Dapper sidecar allows um, you know, um, uh, they communicate with each other, so you don't have to know the IP address or the or the URL of the of the other, of the service you want to use on the end. You, you just need to give it a name, right? You know, that's uh, so Dapper would look at it for you. It would set up the HTTPS connection if it's necessary, and uh, you know, because the Dapper sidecar can expose the HTTP interface as well, so you can connect to the Dapper sidecar directly from the outside, and then you know, so for instance, you can connect to the Dapper sidecar that's attached to the event service and send it the image and say, I want to recognize what's on the image. So the Dapper sidecar knows how to communicate with the other three, the other two Dapper sidecars to send that image to the image classify service. And the image classify service would run the TensorFlow model and uh, uh, get the result and then um, uh, record the event in the event, uh, in a, in, in, in the event service and then return that, the result to, to the service caller, right? So it's a really, um, you know, um, um, you know um, we, you know, in the microservice context, we really love that, um, that approach because I think it's a, it's a really good fit for WebAssembly because WebAssembly um, still has this, um, you know, um, on the, it's, on, it's still a baby, it's growing up, you know, it's, uh, um, it, it it's can do a lot of things, but it still has a lot of things that's, um, you know, even look at early days of Java, it's the same thing. Lots of libraries are not available. You know, that's why I want to do X, you know, very particular thing that's not available. But in all likelihood, the Dapper would allow, us, uh, would allow us to do that, right? So let me, um, let me go into the demo where um, what I'm going to do is that, um, um, sorry, where is it? Okay, here. So um, I'm going to kick off the CI build um, because it takes, um, I think 10, about 15 minutes to, um, to fr from the front end to, to the end. So, you know, so I'm gonna kick out the build and then I'm gonna go through the CI document to show you all the steps, what, um, what the build does, right? So what we, uh, you know, I, as you can see, I already successful run, you know, that's, I did my homework, right? I know it runs, but I'm gonna show you, so I'm gonna say uh, rerun all jobs. And uh, um, what it does is that it's gonna 
um, kick off uh, GitHub action, gonna get a Ubuntu server, and it would start to build it. That's one, two, three. I mean, is that really that slow? <laughs> okay, it started, and um, we can see now it's um, installing the uh, Linux packages. So let's sh sh um, let me show you the, the the configuration file. What we do here, right? You know, so it start the first task. It's really to say it runs on Ubuntu 20.04, and then it installs the, all the packages. So it does upgrade, and it does uh, you know things like wget, curl get, and you know things like that. The common developer um, uh, package that 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 you would need. And it installs and runs MySQL. You know why? Because you see the diagram I did show you before. The event service has a MySQL database that's connected to it. So it writes into that My, MySQL database, right? And uh, it uh, installs the Rust uh, target for Wasm. It's what Haida has said. You know, um, um, you need to install the Rust target for Wasm 32 Wasi, you know, that's so that Rust can compile into WebAssembly. Uh, because by default, Rust compiles into the uh, whatever the uh, CPU that's, it, that, that happens on your machine, right? And in, installs Wasm Edge, so we have a script that allows you to install a very sp uh, specific version of Wasm Edge. But there's a, an interesting aspect is that, you know, uh, there's TF extension, you know, so meaning it's a TensorFlow extension. Uh, in Wasm Edge, we have a, a plugin um, a system where, um, you know, you can have, um, we, we keep the core runtime very, uh, very lean. But uh, you can have those plugins that you can install um, into the runtime. So, for instance, the whole um, the TensorFlow stuff and uh, uh, the PyTorch stuff. You know, um, they are all. You know, so if, if you want to do a, a model inference on PyTorch, you know, you you need the PyTorch extension because you need the, the the libraries to access the GPU and you know things like that. So, you know, there's. Um, you know, we have lots of extensions in in Wasmage. That's one of our strengths. You know, is that uh, you know people can come in and develop. You know, people would say, okay, I can't do this in Wasm. I would say, you know, just go develop a Wasm Edge extension, you know, and, uh, and, and you will be able to do that in Wasm. You know, that's, um, you know, the same conversation happened a lot during this KubeCon. You know, people come up to say, I want to do X, but it doesn't, um, but, um, you know, but I can't do that in Wasm. You know, that's, uh, I would say, you know, just, um, sure you can. You know, you just, uh, um, you know, um, do an extension. So we have a, uh, actually, uh, we have a, um, a Google Summer of Docs um, a program that we have, you know, um, um, and several documentation writers to help us, um, you know, um, uh, polish the, 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 the technical documentation for, for plugin development. But anyway, that's, uh, that's a little wrong. So, you know, so then install an init dapper. So let me see where it's now. So now it's, it's already starting the dapper service now. You know, so let me, uh, so um, we have gone through all the steps, right? We have gone through the install, the, the, um, um, the Rust compiler target, the um, uh, Wasm Edge, and uh, install an init dapper is really just one command. It gets a dapper binary and then starts it, right? You know, so, and then you start dapper services like a sentry service because, you know, those dapper uh, sidecars have to discover each other, right? You know, so let's close all this because, you know, they, they do have a lot of locks. Now I'm at a step where I would compile and run my application, right? You know, so. So here, right here, run grayscale. So this four commands, really just three commands, because the first is just enter that directory. The cargo build is to build a Wasm binary out of it. Then the uh, Wasm HC is the optional step, which I just uh, talked about, is to AOT compile the, 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 um, the Wasm binary into a, low, uh, into a, a, a machine native binary on that machine. You know, that's, uh, uh, in, some, in many cases, to dramatically improve performance. You know, that's uh, um, so, but in some cases, if you say if you just have a microservice that needs to make HTTP call, you don't need this, you know, because the vast amount of time you are spending is waiting for the other side to respond, right? You know, so, but if uh, for compute intensive applications, like, um, you know, um, image processing and, you know, things like that, it's, uh, it's really nice to, uh, to do this. And then it's just a dapper. You know, dapper run, it's, uh, uh, it's an interesting command. You know, it's, uh, it runs dapper at a port and it then runs an application that attached to Dapper in another port. So they form a pair. You know, that's uh, the sidecar and the application, right? You know, so now the sidecar knows how to communicate with each other. But in this command, uh, you know, when you do Dapper run, it actually starts Dapper with the, with the um, you know, um, with its attached application. And uh, um, the process is slow because the cargo build, because, you know, um, as you know, 
uh, one of the um, criticism of Rust is that um, the, um, the compiling takes a very long time, but for good reason, because Rust compiler really does a, do a lot. You know, it's, uh, it finds all the potential problems for you. You know, that's, uh, um, so I think it's, uh, it's time well spent, but we are, um, let's see where they are now. And uh, okay, so it's still running grayscale, so it's, uh, you see it's still compiling, and it's does, it does the, uh, um, you know, the, the um, uh, WASM HC, it's the, the local compiling. And then do the exact same thing with the, um, um, with the API classify, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, an, another image processing, and you know, that's the second image processing um, a microservice, that's that, that way I'm showing in the graph, right? It's uh, take an image and then um, uh, recognize what's on it and return the English name for that image, um, for, for that object, right? And then you run the event service. The event service is also, let me go into the source code of the event service and then the uh, classify service. So the event service, the source code is also very interest, um, very simple, it's just the main.js. What it does is um, in the main function, it starts a dapper client, so it no longer starts, uh, say, HTTP server or anything like that, because it doesn't need that anymore, because dapper handles that for you, right? And then it's, uh, oh, it does start, uh, sorry, I'm, I misspoke. Uh, dapper use HTTP to communicate with it, so it does need a, a HTTP server just like before. But it's, um, um, it's it, it, and it also connects to the database, so both pieces are still there in the, in the events service. However, what dapper does is that it's, you can see the, when it starts the MySQL connection pool, it no longer has to hard code the password in that. You know, um, when we did the demo, the, 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 the username and the password was hard coded into the Rust code. I don't know if you noticed that. When Haidai did the demo, it passed as an environmental variable on the command line. But in Dapper, because Dapper has a secret store, it's like a vault, right? You know, so you can put the data in the vault so that um, it become a Dapper service. You can go uh, ask Dapper, what's my username and password, right? You know, so you, you would never ever, ever forget it, you know, and it's, uh, and it's also uh, make it much nicer in terms of automation, you know. So, you know, this is the first Dapper um, uh, service that we use. It's a vault service, right? You know, so you go and ask the local store, ask the encrypted local store, what's my username and password, and it would tell you. you uh, essentially, you connect to the sidecar and ask for, for that information, and using that information, you connect to the database, right? And then, you know, there are things like, um, you know, um, um, say if I want to um, create an event, um, I do the uh, SQL stuff which we have shown, or which we have seen, but we also do um, the key value stuff. Let me see, where's, the, where's my key value stuff? Um, insert. Where's my key value store? This is the SQL, right? But um, maybe not. Okay, so you know, uh, now I remember, it's in another service. Let's go to the classify service. Uh, let's see how Dapper is used in here. Oh, um, by the way, uh, yeah, yeah, let's, let's do that. So go to the, uh, when we go to the classify service, we open up the main.rs, here, you still have, you have the same thing, you know, that's uh, to connect to Dapper Sidecar, to, uh, to open HTTP port. Now you don't have a database, right? You know, because the database is now handled by events. So when something comes in, how do you tell the events to save my data? You see, it becomes a Dapper client invoke service, event service, you know. So now you only need to give its name. You don't need to know where, which machine the event service is running, which port it's running, you know, that's uh, things that you, you're likely not to remember. And how do you make a uh, authenticated HTTPS connection to it, right? You know, so it, it just needs to know it's event service and the, the function it calls on that, on, that, on that service is called create event. And then you send the event data that you want it to save there, right? And then you can also save it locally. Uh, and you know, you keep um, here, we have some events saved on the event server, but also have some, um, you know, um, uh, data locally because um, uh, here we want to prevent people from abusing us. We don't want people to um, sending, um, you know, 
um, a gazillion images and, uh, and, and, and consume all our computational resources. So we lock the IP address and their time. So, you know, each IP address would only be able to send in a, like one image per minute, you know, whatever, right? You know, so you can have a lot of things you can do here. And here we use a key value store. You use, say, you know, a client, which is, uh, um, uh, which is a connection to the diaper sidecar to say save state, right? You know, so you can save any state you want at key value into your local store. And, um, you know, all those are shared in a, in a, um, in, in an entire environment. But I know, you know, that's um, maybe something that you are also very curious is how do we do image recognition? It's really just this, those lines of code, you know, it's super simple. You know, it's, um, we extract the body from the, from the, um, from the HTTP post. You know, the, the, the body is an is a, um, is a image. And, uh, and then we, uh, we use a special function. It's called Wasm Edge TensorFlow Load JPEG to uh, RGB8, you know, so meaning it's, uh, it's load the JPEG image and turn it into a tensor format so that the uh, TensorFlow model can consume, right? You know, so different models have different requirements. So here is a, what do we call image pre-processing. Uh, pre and uh, a lot of those, um, you know, in traditional machine learning tasks, those are done in Python, right? You know, so, and then we start a session, and then we do session, we load the image data, we load the model data, and uh, we add the input, and then we just uh, say, get output, that's it. You know, that's, uh, it goes to uh, TensorFlow and does the inference. If you have GPU, it does it on the GPU. The output is an array, you know, it's a, it's a list of numbers. The, those numbers are probabilities. They correspond to the predetermined set of objects that, uh, that the model has been trained on. So the model may be trained to recognize a, a thousand objects. So it would give, a, give you an array of a thousand uh, numbers, and each number corresponds to the probability of one of those images, right? You know, then you pass through those, the list of objects and match who's, who has the biggest, highest probability, and then return the result. You know, that's it. You, you know, that's, you can see, you know, um, people say Python is easy, but you know, this, this whole thing, I can do uh, image recognition in half a screen, you know, that's, uh, um, so I would argue, um, you know, and, and in much, I don't need the Python runtime, I don't need all the dependency libraries that Python may bring, I don't even need Linux, you know, that's, uh, um, you know, it's, uh, I think it's a lot lighter approach to do, um, you know, to do inference on the production, you know, that's, um, you know, so, so, so that highlights one of the, uh, one of the benefits. And uh, uh, I also show you, um, so that you can remember, the image that I sent to the, um, you know, um, in our demo, the image I sent to the service to recognize. Okay, so remember, so this is the image we sent to it. Let's see here whether it's finished yet. No, it's still doing the um, event service. Okay, so let's see, um, I think it's gonna finish in, in about, Two minutes, okay. So, but, so let's go and see um, what are the tests that we run. So we build those applications and then we compile them and we start them and now we run tests. The tests are those curl statements, you know, so we run a bunch of those, okay. So essentially the first is we do init. Um, what does init do? It's uh, because the event service has a database attached to it, right? You remember, so you know, so we have to initialize the database. We either do it in code or we ask the user to do it. Here we, we do it ourselves. You know, the user initializes it. So we init the database and we get the events. It should come back with an empty array. And then we um, test the, um, the, um, um, uh, um, the grayscale service. Then we test the um, image recognition service. Oh, okay, so it's food.jpg, not demo.jpg. So l let me go back to look at the food.jpg um, um, uh, image. And then we look at the events again, because we called both services. They should have saved something into the events database and we would be able to see that in the MySQL database, right? You know, so that's a, you know, a fairly simple, uh, simple thing to, to do. So it's in docs and uh, food.jpg. Oh, okay. Same thing, you know. So that's um, that's the image we feed into the um, we feed uh, we feed into the model to to see if it can recognize that, right? So I think okay, it's uh, it's almost done. It's um, it's running the AOT compiler. You know, the AOT compiler, um, like I said, is um, is um, uh, compiles um, 
um, the WebAssembly bytecode to native code for the machine it is currently running on. You know, that's uh, um, I wish Java has that, you know, because that really improves performance by orders of magnitude. But I think the Grail VM now has it, so maybe Java is getting there as well. But you know, that's uh, um, but this is one of the things that's um, nice things when you have um, you know uh, compiled languages like Go and Rust that you, you can do things like that, right? You know, because it's um, um, it's easier to translate them directly into into machine code. You know, that's with with WebAssembly, of course, we have the sandbox. That's uh, that wraps around it, so so that you can't even with machine code you can't escape the sandbox. So, um, well, you know that's um, it's still doing the compilation. You know, um, in fact, in this particular demo, we can uh, we don't have to do that because of, um, because the bulk of the um, performance issues, you know, that's was um, happens in the um, um, in, in TensorFlow. You know, not inside. This um, this Wasm application, so you know, um, so it takes the image and it passes off to TensorFlow and runs on GPU and then come back, right? You know, that's a, um, although in this case is um, because um, GitHub Actions only has CPU, so it runs on CPU. But uh, you know, uh, the bulk of the Tensor operation is um, is um, is not done here, so so I don't have I don't necessarily have to do the AOT compilation. You know, the AOT compilation may improve the performance by x two x here. You know, but uh, it's not like uh, 10x or, or 100x here, but but since I'm I'm already I, I have this in my script, so we'll have to wait until it finish. So, so let's wait for another minute. <laughs> let's see if if there are anything else I want to show you here. So yeah, so you know you can see this is um, how you load the load the model, and this is the uh, the, the label file I talked about. You know, so it's uh, interesting about TensorFlow is that because you know really what goes into it, the PyTorch is the same thing. What go into it and what come out of it are all numbers. You know, so how to map the numbers into English words or into um, something that you can interpret is what the application does, right? You know, so you know, so you would. Um, uh, typically, it would be a Python application, but here we have a Rust application. You know, um, so it prepares the data, and uh, once you, oh, here it's done. Okay, so you know, um, that, so let's see the wrong tests. The wrong tests. Let me just show you the result because the result all jammed together. You know, it's here. So the first, uh, stop. What? Okay, cancel. Okay. So the first is status true. Remember the, what's the first thing we did is the init, right? You know, is that uh, I create the database table. The second is an empty array. Okay, so I do the events. So it come back with the events of the of the database table I just uh, created, which is empty. The third is hot dog is detected with the confidence of this, right? You know, do you remember the picture you see? Right. It looks like hot dog, right? You know, so it's a. Uh, and it's de detected with a very high confidence. You know, it's a. Uh, um, you know, in those. Um, you know, a, a thousand item array, this, this one is almost, um, you know, um, 1.0, and everyone else has very mi mi uh, minute probabilities. And then, um, and then we, uh, we go back to the events database and to query the data, uh, event service to query the database again. So now it has two events here. Event number one is the grayscale event. Um, I didn't show the output of grayscale because, you know, I can't show that in a, in a console. You know, that's, uh, um, but you can see that in the grayscale event, and uh, it's, it knows what the input size is and what the timestamp is. And the event number two is the uh, um, classify event. So, um, so this whole um, um, this whole Dapper application, I think, shows um, you know it's a it's a fairly complicated setup. But in a lot of microservices, I think it's a, it's a fairly typical level of complexity that's um, that people are dealing with. You know that's why we need uh, things like sidecars, right? You know so. It's a uh, um, it's couple services that all depend on each other. They have, um, you know, and uh, um, they need to discover each other, and they need to share a common set of, um, you know, infrastructure services. Like in this case, the key value store and the um, the um, you know the secret store for the for the database access, right? So you know, and you can do a lot more complex with Dapper. You know, that's you can do messaging queues and you know things like that. And uh, um, I'll leave you to um, to discover all this. But you know um, the the GitHub repository is here. You know, it's uh, if you don't want to mess up your own machine by setting up all this, I think you can just fork it 
and then run it in GitHub Actions yourself, you know, and see all the output. And you can, you know, you can change things and see if the GitHub Actions change. For instance, you can change the image, right? You know, that's uh, this image, this docs, docs, slash, docs slash food dot jpeg. You can put another image here and see if it's gonna recognize that. I, I encourage you to try it. You know, that's uh, it's it's actually quite amazing. You know how how accurate it can to um, you know um, to to recognize stuff. So um, I think that's um, that's this demo. And uh, um, okay, I think we have one last one. We we'll, uh, we have 15 minutes left. Um, yeah. Okay. So you know. Um, we may not really have time to do this demo, but I really encourage you to, because I really want to leave some time for QA. Um, be, uh, I really encourage you to, uh, to try it. What it does is that it's a, it's a bot that does PR review for, uh, for GitHub pull requests. Uh, why do you do that? It's because we are all uh, open source communities. We are as maintainers and uh, or as senior developers. We spend a lot of valuable time um, reviewing uh, PRs and uh, pull requests. And sometimes we are, we are slow and the community is not happy, you know, there's all kinds of things, you know, so it's, it's a very expensive and very slow and a very, um, um, uh, you know, um, uh, irritating process for a lot of people, right? You know, so to speed up PR review, I think it's, it's important for uh, R&D management, especially for open source communities. And so in the Wasm Edge um, uh, repository, we have, a, um, uh, we have a GitHub bot that build on Wasm Edge itself. And uh, um, it's when you submit a PR or you say a magic word in a PR comment, it's, uh, it gets all the files from the PR and uh, send it to chat GPT-4 and uh, ask to review it and uh, ask to come back with recommendations. It's gonna come back with a really r nice written set of things that it thinks that may break, uh, that, 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 that may be pro um, you know, problem with the code. So I just to give you an example because uh, you, you know, I don't, um, I would like you to try this yourself. So I would give you an example to entice you to do that, right? You know, um, we have a PR that's, uh, um, that was submitted by a JavaScript developer and uh, he, uh, uh, in one of the uh, files he changed, he added a function called check prime, right? You know, to check the prime number. And uh, his implementation is to set up a loop to start from two to square root of n, right? The input is n. And uh, to test uh, um, each number, whether it can be divided by, um, you know, divided by n. And uh, if any of those numbers can be divided, um, it would just return to say this is not, n is not a prime number. And if none of them can, it's gonna return to say n is a prime number. That's pretty reasonable, right? You know, that's, in fact, that's how I would write it. You know, that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, um, um, uh, GPT-4 saw that and the GPT-4 said, um, you know, um, um, the function gives the correct results, which is true, um, but it can be improved. Uh, um, how, how to improve it? It says, um, because you don't need to try even numbers over again, right? You know, so from two to square root of n, you don't need to go one in step, you can go two in steps, right? You, you know, or two and three and then go all the, do all the um, odd numbers instead of trying even numbers all over again, right? So I think this is, um, you know, obviously you can, you can go along that line. You can even ask more questions to it to say, can you write the code for me? Or can you, um, you know, um, further improve it? Because now I understand multiples of primes that I have discovered, or uh, you know, none of them need to be tried, right? You know, so, um, so is this one of the examples? No, I'm not. Oh. Oh, what are we doing? Okay. Yeah, so you know that's uh, so we have that integrated into our repository, and it's uh, it's uh, um, it's I you know to me it's eye opening because uh, it finds a lot of issues. It, uh, you know, it's find a lot of issues that humans tends to overlook. You know, in terms of you know um, um, uh, you know um, uh, programming issues and programming bugs. So, uh, do you want to hear something here? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's um, you know. So for all the things that I said, they, it gave me one sentence. The check prime function can be optimized further as it checks the divisibility of even numbers after two, which isn't necessary, you know. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, um, it, it blows my mind. You know, that's, it finds a lot of issues like that, you know, uh, let me tell you. So, so you know, so, so the, uh, and why this is a good use case for, for Wasm as a, as a microservice is because in this function, Wasm does very little 
the, the, the microservice does very little. Most of the time, it's spent waiting for GPT-4 to respond. So to spin up a Linux container or a micro VM just to do an HTTP connection and wait for, you know, because GPT-4 could take three, three minutes to come up with a complete answer. You know, that's, it's, 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 it's super slow. To wait for that long to get an answer, I think it's very, it's extremely wasteful. You know, you are wasting like a, like a half a CPU core just for that, right? You know, that's a, but with Wasm, you can scale to zero. You can have something that is wait there that consumes very little uh, resources. And once it's done, it's com it, it, it gets completely shut off. So, you know, so, so we thought that's a, that's a really interesting use case that's, uh, um, you know, that we use ourselves in our community. And uh, uh, if you'd like to set it up, you know, we'd uh, love to help you set it up. And, um, and because this is all written in code, this is written in code that compiled WebAssembly, so you can have all kinds of ways you can customize it. You can change it, you can change the prompt. You can tell it, you know, and, uh, say certain things, but don't say certain things. Look for formatting errors, or, uh, or, or the code I'm gonna give you are all JavaScript, you know, just uh, do not consider other languages. You can, do a, you can do a lot of things. And uh, yeah, that's, um, um, do you have anything to add with this? Yeah. Um, no. Uh, here are some resources to uh, follow up with us. Uh, we have a Discord server, and if you are in CNCF uh, Slack workspace, you can join our WordMage uh, Slack channel. Uh, is there anyone has any questions? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So enjoy your lunch. Um, enjoy your lunch, and if you have questions, we're gonna be here. We're gonna we're gonna skip lunch, and <laughs> you know. So if you have uh, anything you want to talk about, so three of us are gonna be here. Thank you. Yeah.